Welcome to another episode of Super Bites with Suhani Single. One concept which I really want to highlight and introduce in this video is the importance of role models, especially for girls who are interested in computer science and technology. Role models in computer science will help us learn about the journey which is needed in order to pursue this field, as well as the obstacles along the way and the advice which is needed to be successful. As a result, today I'm here in San Francisco at the LinkedIn office in order to interview our role model, Caroline Gaffney. Caroline grew up in Connecticut, and ever since she was young, she was interested in science. She majored in chemical engineering at Princeton University and earned her master's at Harvard Business School. After she graduated, she went on to pursue a variety of jobs, mainly working in the product industry at many notable tech companies such as Decorati, Instagram, and LinkedIn. She has been involved in the tech industry for almost 10 years now, as she continues to develop her skills and make a name for herself. At her previous job at Instagram, Caroline worked as a director of product management team to, and helped the platform reach over 1 billion users. Currently, she works at LinkedIn as a chief of staff product, where she helps run the product org of over 1,600 people. Today, I'm sitting down with Caroline to spread her inspirational journey and learn about her as a role model. having me here today. I'm really excited to learn about your story. It's great to have you here. I'm excited to share share whatever I can with you and hopefully someone will find this valuable. Definitely. <laughs> so your career path is very impressive from working at many notable organizations like LinkedIn and Instagram and also graduating from remarkable schools like Princeton and Harvard Business School. Um, and I think for many girls we aspire to be where you are one day. But I would like to start by talking a little bit about your childhood and your past because predominantly our audience um, is middle and high school girls. Okay. So what were your interests and um, your hobbies at an early age? Yeah, so I started, I think, at the most early age, I loved to read. Um, and I just read a ton, everything from fiction books to um, I always liked science and mm -hmm. in particular chemistry. So I would say I started getting into that more, um, reading just about like, you know, how the earth was made or just any kind of general kind of science books. Mm -hmm. And then in high school, that's where I really got into chemistry. Um, and I just liked to build things and to, mm -hmm. to, I loved being in the lab and like trying things out and um, mm -hmm. just seeing like when you combine a couple things together, like what happens and you mm -hmm. know, um, that whole notion of you take a bunch of ingredients and you transform them into something completely different was something that was always interesting to me. Definitely. And how do you think that you got interested in chemistry or in STEM in general? Was there a, some sort of defining moment or a person who inspired you? Yeah, it, it's definitely a combination of the two. I'd say um, there was, I had an amazing chemistry teacher in 10th grade who I also had for AP chemistry in um, senior year. Um, and she um, had started her career actually as a chemist um, working in a nearby um, corporation. Uh, and then she just really wanted to teach. And she, I think, was the one who um, encouraged me to like do extra things, to come and do extra lab work or to take AB chemistry. Um, and I saw that she, you know, was a successful business person, but also really was spending her, she was, I think over 60s, was spending her like kind of second career helping teach um, chemistry to high schoolers was really powerful and inspiring. Um, and I think it was, it was moving to having, I think we had lab like two or three times a week senior mm -hmm. year. I really looked forward to those experiences when we could, we had the opportunity to try our own things and to build out a senior project. Um, so I think it was probably a combination of 10th and 12th grade Definitely. and Mrs. Mervis was her name. <laughs> I think it's really important to have those strong female role models who we can yeah. look up to. Um, they definitely inspire us. Mm -hmm. What was one piece of advice which she gave you or that you remember from her classes that you still use to this day? I would say um, the concept of iteration, which actually is very relevant to what I do in uh, my job as a product manager. Um, you're constantly trying things and then learning what works mm -hmm. and then modifying and trying again. and. Um, and just that concept of you're in a lab and like this thing got messed up, but oh, that can lead to some new 
um, discovery or some new um, challenge that then each step along the way that you iterate teaches you something versus just trying and then not, if it didn't work out, not iterating and you don't learn as much. Right, that's definitely yeah. important. And I definitely, I think, got you somewhere because <laughs> you ended up going to Princeton University for chemical engineering mm -hmm. yeah. and then later on Harvard Business School. And I think for a lot of girls who take STEM classes like chemistry and yeah. like chemical engineering, um, sometimes the classes are more male dominant, which mm -hmm. can be discriminating. So, or maybe they don't get as inspired. So, mm -hmm. did you um, have any male dominated classes, or were your classes, did you have like less uh, females in your classes in college? Yeah, so my chemical engineering class was probably, it was actually of the engineering classes at Princeton, um, the most diverse in terms of male female ratio. It was probably 30% female um, and 7% male. Um, but I did have, we were put into these study groups or we formed our own study groups and mm -hmm. there were two um, other girls who happened to be in my dorm and we quickly formed this great um, support group for each other because right. a lot of the work that you're doing, these problem sets that you have to do every week were really hard and you couldn't do them by yourself. Um, so I think it was a combination of, even if there's like one or two people who you find you can work with, I felt, I never felt um, uh, like I was being held back because I was female. And then also actually, the nice thing was, even though the majority of our professors were male, there were a ton of grad students who were female who um, you could go to their office hours. And so I did have pockets um, where, you know, and also I, I never, um, I think maybe in engineering, um, a lot of the people, both male and female, were um, potentially like scared to talk or mm -hmm. were tended to not be as like outspoken. So I never felt like, a hesitancy to speak my mind. I always felt kind of included. Right, and I think, yeah. like you mentioned, like having that support system is really important because mm -hmm. it also gives you confidence, I think. Yeah, yeah, and also realizing that um, it's okay if you don't know the answer on your own right. and always um, being willing to ask questions and to go to office hours and to work as a team to solve these problems. Um, I found that the people who tried to do it on their own, they were never going to be successful because I mean, part of working, like if you were to extend chemical engineering into a job, you're not working for the most part by yourself. Like you may have some experiments and things that you're doing on, on your own, but really you're a team. And so starting that early on kind of teaches you how to work most effectively. And I think that one thing uh, which I really like about your story is how diverse it is. <laughs> you know, working in chemical engineering, yeah. then being a business analyst, and now yeah. a product manager. Yep. And I think that it's really important and something which I want to highlight is that there isn't one certain path which someone can take yeah. to be successful and to get to where they want to be. Um, so I noticed that you work as a business analyst at McKinsey mm -hmm. & Company and then also at Banana Republic. Yeah. Um, so how are you able to get your foot into the door into a tech career and how was that like change from going to two different careers? Yeah, it's a great point. The first point I definitely want to highlight is that your career, I think in school you're taught okay, I go from grade to grade, I do well, um, and um, I go to the next grade and I do well. Then I get into a good college and I do well. And then, But once you get into your job, it's not as linear as that. And there's so many different paths to success um, and it becomes individual. So that's definitely an important thing to adjust your mindset from a path in school where it's always clear what the next step of success is to where there's many different steps. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second thing is, so I um, I realized at the end of my senior year at Princeton that I didn't want to go down the traditional um, chemical engineering work path of either going to getting a PhD or going to like a refinery at like Exxon or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, what would be the best way to learn about kind of the business world? Um, mm -hmm. And so McKinsey and a lot of other consulting firms teach you, they um, bring you in as an analyst and then you're in a class um, of like let's say 20 to 50 analysts and you rotate among different projects and you really get a good kind of quick overview of what the business world is like and you learn like what a retail company thinks about, what a pharmaceutical company thinks about, what a tech company thinks about. Um, so it was a great kind of training ground. Mm -hmm. um, and But after that, so I did that for two years, went to business school and came back. Um, I realized I wanted to stay in one place. 
and not rotate around. I realized I liked retail as an industry and that I figured out McKinsey. So I was targeting, okay, how do I work at a retailer, um, but still take the skills that I learned from McKinsey and apply them, but at this different company. So that's how I ended up um, going to Banana Republic because I was living in San Francisco and um, uh, actually some folks from McKinsey had gone over there to lead strategy and um, analysis. And so I networked with them through right. the McKinsey Alumni Network. I just emailed them. Um, had coffee with a bunch of them, went through the interview process, mm -hmm. and made that switch. So while you were transitioning to LinkedIn and Instagram into mm -hmm. like the tech um, field and the jobs, did you face any sort of challenges or obstacles, or how was that experience like? Yeah, it is true. In the beginning when I um, first transitioned to work at LinkedIn, um, so I had you know done um, more of a quantitative job at Banana Republic, and then I worked at a startup that... Um, was in the online interior design space. So I'd done some technical work, but because I um, hadn't worked in product management at a large mm -hmm. company before, I and I um, had a chemical engineering degree, not mm -hmm. necessarily a computer science degree, I um, didn't know if I'd be able to get into product management at mm -hmm. LinkedIn. So I just applied to a, what was called back then a product marketing job, um, which was a little bit more strategic but didn't have a requirement of a computer science degree. Okay. Um, and I got my foot in the door and I showed, um, it was really small then, I joined when LinkedIn was 700 people, mm -hmm. now it's like 14,000. Um, and I got my foot in the door and showed that I could do product management and then switched over after a year into product management officially. Okay. Um, so the lesson there is, um, uh, even if there are kind of like artificial barriers that some companies say, don't, you know, I'd say apply for the job that you want, but, or if you really want to work at a particular company, you love the product, just get your foot in the door and things will figure, if you do a good job, things will work out. Right. Um, and so now you're the yeah. chief of staff for product mm -hmm. on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, so to, to those who don't know what that is, what, mm -hmm. what do you do on a daily basis and what does your job entail? Yeah, so chief of staff is an interesting role that I feel like is only really, it um, started actually in the government. So mm -hmm. you hear of um, a lot of people within the White House or various branches of the U.S. government um, will have chiefs of staff who essentially kind of, uh, help them do their job better. So if you're like Secretary of the Treasury, you would have a chief of staff. Um, and similarly in, te in the tech world, so I work for the person who runs all of product management and product okay. in general at LinkedIn. And I do kind of three different things. I help with overall product strategy. So what product should we build? How are our existing products doing? Working with the product managers on each of those. Then the second piece is really how the organization runs. So there's um, around 1,800 people within the organization because it wow. includes product management, design, research, editorial, all of our content businesses, our customer service. So a lot of people. So I kind of help my boss figure out how to communicate with them, what meetings we should have, um, how we think about running the org and the principles that we want to use, what our culture is. Um, and then the last piece I spend time on is how do I um, think about um, uh, more kind of like longer term strategic projects. So how do we improve our recruiting process? How do we improve the way we um, promote people and the way we, um, we do kind of talent reviews, stuff like that. So you've been working in product for a while now and uh, you've accomplished many feats such as helping Instagram with a growth product team and help the product reach over 1 billion users, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Yeah. Um, so what skills or qualities do you think are needed to work in the product field? Um, so I think there are a couple, I'd say there are probably four, three to four areas that I always look at. One is really understanding who the user is and what problems you're trying to solve. Um, so having people sometimes call it empathy for the user. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to help um, someone, let's say um, a freelancer who, let's say I'm a freelance accountant and I have my own business um, and we as LinkedIn want to help that person kind of spread their business. We want to understand like what are their pain points today? How do they think about growing their client base? Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what could we do to help them? So really, going deep with the user. 
And then as part of that, identifying how we as LinkedIn can uniquely, or Instagram, can we uniquely help solve those pain points and what are the features that we can build. So that's really like, um, some people call it product sense, but it's really just understanding what the pain points are, so that's one. Two is communication. Like I said before, mm -hmm. it's both communicating um, a vision to your team, a vision to your CEO, as well as really minute communication like, what's the tracking code going to be on this particular new feature? Because we need a tracking code in order to understand mm -hmm. how well it's doing. Right. Um, and also communicating with other product managers who you might work with and engineers. Um, and the last piece um, I would say is you need to be quantitative um, and te technical to a certain degree mm -hmm. to be able to have deep conversations with engineers, to be able to assess how your business is doing, how your product is, is working, um, and to be able to kind of test and iterate um, over time on, on that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. So there's definitely a lot of like different diverse mm -hmm. things that you need to have to be a product engineer yeah. and a product manager. Yeah. Um, so while you've been working at LinkedIn and Instagram, are there any sort of perks or benefits which you get yeah. <laughs> from working at the big tech companies? Yeah, I'd say there's a bunch of different perks. There's both the perk, um, a technical perk of you get to try out all the new features before they go live, which oh. is kind of cool. <laughs> so at Instagram, we got to try out stories before they went live <laughs> or different filters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, you also, um, a lot of tech companies really take care of their people and they want to um, make people's lives easier. Uh, and so a couple of um, perks that you get are, you know, you get free food, um, mm -hmm. you get snacks, you get, um, depending on the company, um, like fitness benefits, um, you get like dry cleaning pickup. <laughs> I know at Instagram you could leave your dry cleaning mm -hmm. and then they would return it. But it's all about, like, they want you... Um, to to have like to not have to worry and spend time on other stuff and just to make your life easier right and that yeah. flexibility and convenience so you can get your yeah. work done yes exactly yeah and I mean in San Francisco there are shuttles which help which I think personally are good for the environment they help right. shuttle people back and forth from the city instead of having everyone drive and they have mm -hmm. Wi-Fi so you can get your work done you know, and if you have kids and you need to get home early, there's shuttles that start at like 3.30 and you could still work all the way up until you get home. Um, so right. they're really trying to make it convenient for you. Definitely. Um, so as you're advancing through your career, how are you able to maintain a work-life balance? Because I think that's something that's super important to be able to do your work well, but then also to have time for mental health and physical health and for family too. Yeah, I think what I try and do is I um, try and manage my calendar proactively, and during the workday, I try and make sure to have a couple of breaks so that I have time um, where I don't have meetings, where I have time to either like go for a quick walk by myself or um, just to think, and that helps um, create more mental space so I don't feel so harried by the end of the day. Um, and then also, um, I have a great kind of support system at home. I have children, um, so I have my nanny who will get them all ready so that when I come home, um, you know, they're bathed and showered and stuff, and I can just hang out with them. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, some evenings, I'll, um, you know, check email or whatever on my phone, um, but I have that flexibility to kind of go home when I need to, um, but then also be engaged in people, if there's something urgent, they can always reach me through chat or whatever it is. Do you have any fun hobbies that you do outside of work? I do, I, um, so I grew up ice skating, but I don't, I can't do that anymore, but I do um, Pilates, okay. which is kind of like a, if people haven't heard of it, it's um, a combination of like strength training and um, yoga, but much more focused on like your core strength right. and full body. Um, strength so I like it I, I mentioned ice skating because I like it because it's kind of similar in that you do different choreography of movements mm -hmm. um, that build up your strength and I feel like that plus I also um, ride the peloton bike um, oh, and that's okay. good cardio too so it's a combination of strength training and cardio and mm -hmm. I feel like mentally and physically it kind of gives me a break from um, you know, the day to day. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think that was one challenge that some people might uh, be worried about. Some girls, like, am I going to be able to have that work life balance? Yeah. Um, but what do you think is a key challenge which women are facing today in the tech industry or career, and how do you think that we can help solve it? So I think a challenge would be um, what you were alluding to before about having role models. I think mm -hmm. um, 
sadly there still are few women who are in very senior positions. You definitely see a lot of women kind of at the entry level, it's like usually 50-50. Um, but as you get to more senior positions, you do see more women dropping out. Um, right. and, um, and so if you don't have the role model, it's hard for you as someone kind of up and coming to either mm -hmm. have, find a mentor, just because there aren't that many, or to see yourself in others. Right. Um, so I think things like uh, this video series are helpful just if you don't have a physical role model, but showing someone um, as you know a video or mm -hmm. being able to read books about people who have done that, like just getting yeah. more examples out in front of girls that they can do it. Like even you know something as simple as like Michelle Obama's book, mm -hmm. just seeing how she reading how um, all people from all different backgrounds can be successful just gives a little bit of confidence that right. um, that uh, they can do it too. Um, and then I'd say the other thing would be, and this we talk about at LinkedIn a lot is. Um, early on connecting you to someone who maybe is a couple years ahead of you um, mm -hmm. to give you advice and kind of give you that little push yeah. um, uh, is definitely has been helpful in my career. I've had a kind of mentor person who's always kind of like push, push me to join Instagram and push me to kind of always challenge myself a little bit out of my comfort zone. Definitely. That's really important, I think, just to see someone who's a couple years ahead mm -hmm. where you're going to be someday and you yeah. have to do that. Yeah. So you've definitely given a lot of good advice, mm -hmm. but I would like to play a quick game um, just to learn a little bit more about you okay. and so that everyone else can learn more about you too. So I have a couple of questions, so you can pick three um, okay. and then just answer them and read the question out loud. Okay. Let's see. Okay, and the first one. Name three things about you that nobody knows. Um, let's see. Nobody knows. Um, well, I, this audience would not know. I have three sisters, um, and we're so we're four girls, and um, we are um, all two years apart. Um, and so I kind of grew up like um, being kind of a pseudo mom to my youngest because she's six years younger mm -hmm. than me. And I guess the piece that nobody knows is when I went to college, she was uh, entering seventh grade. So she was very little. Mm -hmm. And she used to call me crying when I yeah. first went to college. And she missed me. And um, to this day, we're still super close. We were just mm -hmm. traveling together. So it's one. Um, something else nobody knows. Um, uh, I'm, like, very flexible. I can, like lean over and touch the back of my hands to the floor mm -hmm. without bending my knees. So hyper flexible. <laughs> but I think helps uh, with probably Pilates. Yeah, right? it's actually, yeah. It, yeah, and it's actually really good in Pilates. Um, uh, and actually Pilates probably made it better. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I used to swim as well. Um, and so uh, one kind of funny thing that used to always happen is I used to ice skate and then go I used to swim and then go to ice skating and like every day my hair would freeze because <laughs> I was wet and then I had to go mm -hmm. to the, the ice rink so I felt like I spent the majority of my high school experience with like frozen hair. <laughs> it's a random thought. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's one. Okay. Let's see. What is the last book I read? Um, actually, I just finished an amazing book. Um, it was the Trevor Noah book, Born a Crime. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he's a, um, a famous comedian, but he grew up in South Africa um, at a very kind of tumultuous time. I um, mean, he's half um, black and half white, half Caucasian. And so just his, uh, his experience uh, is both hysterical because he is a comedian, but also just amazing how um, he was able to kind of make it through at, um, a very unique period in history. So I highly recommend it. Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. <laughs> Um, All right, last one. Okay, last one. Let's see. Last one. What is your favorite word? Um, I think the word I use a lot is um, is totally. <laughs> and I, even though it sounds it sounds kind of um, lacking substance, but actually, I think um, when I agree with something and I want to kind of provide, especially like if I had my Instagram team or people I was working with and I wanted to kind of 
give them encouragement. I think I, yeah. it's a positive affirmation, like, mm-hmm. totally, you're, you're right. You're on the right so, track. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I think I, I like that positive word. So the last question I have for you is, what advice would you give to middle and high school girls who are interested in pursuing a career in computer science or maybe still don't know what they want to do yet? Yeah, so my advice would be seek out people who are doing something that you find interesting that you might want to do um, and don't hesitate to reach out um, and set up a coffee with them or even just a quick phone call. You will not regret just having those conversations. Each conversation adds up to um, a lot of just knowledge and helps you think about what you want to do. And then you might have a conversation with someone that then leads to a job in the future or that person might know someone else. And so just don't be scared to reach out. Everyone wants to help. Everyone um, starts from somewhere or starts not knowing anyone. And really the power of your um the people you know and as we say at LinkedIn your network is is something that um, will pay dividends over um, your lifetime so really invest and start in starting to build that now wow thank you so much for inviting me here today at LinkedIn I had a great time and I'm sure a lot of girls will be inspired by this video and learning about your journey great it was great to meet you and to chat about yeah. this and yeah hopefully it helps and if anyone wants to reach out to me on LinkedIn they can <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks.